Well, in preparing to minister to you this week, um, I had a message. It was all ready and typed up, and then the Lord totally changed my message. And so um, he gave me some things specifically. I believe it's for you. I believe it's a word in due season. It fits in with the direction that we've been going these last few weeks. We've been doing a study that we've called 23. We've been looking at the reality of the Lord being our shepherd. And this morning specifically, the title of my message is Pick Up Your Sword. Come on, somebody say, Pick Up My Sword. Pick up my sword. Look at your neighbor, say, Pick Up Your Sword. Now you might say, what does that mean? All right, you'll find out as we go, all right? You'll find out as we go. So I want us to start over here in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7. I want to encourage you for a moment with the words of the Apostle Paul as he gives kind of a summary and some final words to his life and ministry. And I believe the Lord wants us to hear it with a fresh faith this morning and apply it to our own lives and see ourselves this way. How many of you know we're taught to follow the faith of our leaders? Our leaders, our spiritual leaders, we're taught to walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham. The Bible says in Hebrews to be followers of them through faith, who through faith and patience obtain the promises. So, and even our spiritual leaders, we're taught as Christians to follow the faith of our leaders before us, our spiritual leaders, pastors, ministers, what have you. And so that always inspires me about the importance of living a life of faith. How many of you know the Bible says the just shall what? Live, how? By faith. So faith isn't just a message or a topic that we study or something we take notes on and you know, just kind of log away some information. Faith is how we live. Faith pleases God. It's our relationship with him is built on that trust we have in him and upon his word. And we're taught to learn from the faith of others and copy how they live their life of faith so that we learn how to do it ourselves. How many of you know that you want your kids, for those of you that have children, to learn how to do things for themselves? Can I hear an amen, somebody? <laughs> Come on, you want them to what? Learn how to do it for themselves. And as they get older, you definitely want them to what? Learn how to be a functioning human being in society, right? How to do things for yourselves. And so our Heavenly Father is the same way. Come on, for us spiritually, our Heavenly Father wants us to be strong in faith ourselves. And we've been given some amazing examples in God's word that we can copy, faith that we can follow. The greatest example, we're going to look at his example together this morning, is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ himself. He's our standard. Hallelujah. And we want to learn from Jesus the highest standard and say, Lord, I'm following your faith. But then the Apostle Paul also said, follow me as I follow Christ. And I'm telling you, the Apostle Paul, as we see it in Scripture, he left a legacy of faith. And so let's start with those words of the Apostle Paul, 2 Timothy 4, 7. He said it this way at the end of his journey. He said, I have fought a good fight. Come on, somebody say a good fight. A good fight. It's been said, and it's true, a good fight is a fight you win. I've been in some fights. Come on, I've been in some playground fights. I'm not going to go too deep into these, these stories with you. But I've been in some fights, and the best fights aren't the fights where you're bleeding and you're crying and the other person standing there laughing. The best fights are the fights that you win. And so Paul said, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. Man, didn't just start his course, didn't just get halfway, didn't get almost there, but then he you know, didn't quite finish. No, he said, I have fought a good fight. I've finished this thing. I've run the race. In other words, he's saying, I've lived this life that God's called me to live. I fulfilled the calling. Come on, Paul met Jesus on the road to Damascus and everything changed. And he began to pursue that high calling of God that's in Christ. And here he said, you can bring it back up. I have fought a good fight. I have what? I'm pointing to nothing. Okay, there we go. There it is. I have, <laughs> I'm pointing by faith. Thank you, Jesus. All right. I have finished my course. I have kept the what? the faith. And so he said, I have fought a good fight. Did you know that you and I are going to have to fight a good fight as well? And that you have to have some fight about you in this Christian life. And if you and I are going to echo the words of the apostle Paul at the end of our life, that we fought the good fight, we finished our course, we've kept the faith. We're going to have to have some fight about us. Now, too many times Christians are fighting with each other instead of fighting the good fight of faith. So there are fights that we shouldn't be fighting, but there are other fights that we must fight 
in order to end in the places that the Lord has for us where our calling is concerned, where the plan and purpose of God is concerned. Because there is, whether you realize it or not, an enemy of your soul who wants to discourage you, who wants to bully you, who wants to intimidate you with fear and, yeah. and get you into a place of instability where you're, you're kind of vacillating, you're back and forth, wavering where maybe the things of God are concerned or where his word is concerned. And so we have to learn as children of God, those that are born again, followers of Jesus, disciples of Jesus Christ in a new and a better covenant, established upon better promises, called to live our lives by faith, we've got to learn how to fight and the fight that we should be fighting is the fight of faith. Amen. Now, let's look here in Second Tim, or excuse me, 1 Timothy now, chapter 6 and verse 12. Listen to what it says here. Paul again writing to Timothy, a young pastor. And he says, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Timothy, fight the good fight of faith. We already read that, right? What did I, okay, wait, what did I do? Did I go to the wrong, did I give you the wrong reference? All right, so if you're taking notes, I just want to make sure this is clear. We looked at 2 Timothy 4, 7. Now, I think I quoted it a half a dozen times, but now we're reading it. All right. 1 Timothy 6, 12. Look at these words. He said, Timothy, fight the what? The good fight of faith. Come on, say it again. A good fight. Good fight. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto you are also called, and have, this is connected to it, professed a good profession before many witnesses. So here we see it again. Paul said to Timothy, fight a good fight of faith. So we're talking together about this fight of faith. Now, if you understand anything about faith as you look at it in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, the fight of faith involves, as we see here in this verse, your profession, your confession, your words, spoken out of a heart full of what it is you believe. And so faith is, man, this is so powerful. Faith is not silent. Faith vocalizes what it believes. And so we're not ashamed of our faith in Jesus. We're not ashamed of our Christian, Christian testimony. We're not ashamed no matter what kind of persecution, no matter what comes. Come on, we are not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation. And so a part of the fight of faith is saying, look, I don't care really what anybody thinks. We love everybody, but man, our faith is in God. Our faith is in Jesus Christ, and we're unashamed about that. Can I hear an amen, somebody? Yeah. And so as believers, we want to have that profession of our faith in Jesus Christ. But as believers, it doesn't stop with just our profession of him as the Lord of our life because we live by faith. That means that we declare who he is to us as he has revealed it to us in his word. Our faith is in God. And if our faith is in God, then I cannot be silent about who he is to me based on what he has said to me. And what he has said to me in his word is the foundation of my faith. So my words of faith are powerful because I'm saying what he has already said and his words are alive and they are full of power. Now, why am I talking to you about this? Because you're going to have to, and I'm going to have to, if we're going to get all the way to the end, fulfill our divine destiny in Christ and do everything that God's called us to do, we've got to learn how to fight. And look, God's word teaches us how to fight this fight of faith. And there are times where you can't be silent. Times where you've got to lift your voice and you have to put the devil back in his place and say, oh no, you don't. You're not having my mind. You're not having my body. You're not having my family. You're not having my kids. You're not going to have my community. You're not having my nation. I'm about to fight right now. I'm pulling out my sword and I'm about to fight, not a physical fight, because we're not wrestling with flesh and blood, but I'm about to fight the fight of faith, and this is a good fight, because I'm fighting from a place of victory in Christ. I'm fighting with the most powerful weapons and tools. Come on, the best military in human history hasn't, hasn't even scratched the surface of what we're talking about right now. We're talking about spiritual weapons from Almighty God, the one who makes planets. I mean, the one who made you, the one who created everything that we see. He's the one who empowers us to fight this fight. Now, I just want to remind you of who your daddy is this morning. Come on, I'm talking about your heavenly father. 
Your heavenly father is the almighty God who made everything. You're his child. And he wants to teach us and I believe stir us up this morning about fighting this good fight of faith. And for some of you, this message is coming to you in a moment where you need it. And this is an equipping right now. This is like a training right now, all right? So I have the privilege of serving as a police chaplain. And man, I have never been more aware of training (laughs) than I have been once I I came into this world of law enforcement. Spend a lot of time with police officers and in their world. And and if you know anything about law enforcement, they train and they train and they train and they train. Training is important because in a time of crisis, in a time of emergency, you're going to react out of that training. And those skills that you're developing and working on, man, when the fight is on, how many of you know you need to tap into something? You need to have it. Well, I believe there are some of you in this room right now, man, you're in, a, you're in the middle of a fight. I don't know. Maybe you're all like bloodied and this is like you getting in the corner right now, kind of like Rocky, you know, they're putting the compre- cold co- compress on his face. You got Mick over there and he's like, Rock, I know you can do it right with his voice. Get back in there, Rock. You know, and he's like, oh, you ain't trying on my way to the for you. <laughs> if I could change, if yous can change, we all can change. All right, Rocky Four. <laughs> But look, some of you right now, you're not laughing because you know what I'm talking about. You're in the middle of a fight for your life. You feel like, man, I don't think I could stand anymore. I believe you're in the right place at the right time. And the Lord wants to give you some, some strength this morning by the power of his word, the power of his Holy Spirit. Because all of us, if we're gonna reach the end of our divine destiny in Christ, we have to understand how to fight the good fight of what? of faith. And so in the 23rd Psalm, as we've been looking at it together for the last few weeks, we are really stepping into the middle and we're, by the help of the Holy Spirit, seeing David in the middle of a faith fight. We know the story, his back's against the wall, it looks like it's over for David. Scholars say either King Saul's chasing him, trying to kill him, or his his son Absalom is chasing him, trying to kill him. You know, it's a very difficult moment. Looks like it's over for David. Everybody's saying there's no help for him in God. And in the 23rd Psalm and also Psalm 3, which is an account of David when he's fleeing from his son Absalom, we see this moment of of severe distress and it looks as if it's over, that David's not going to finish the course, that he's not gonna do everything that the Lord had called him to do. It looks like It's almost over, and there's a much bigger picture here. How many of you know that it wasn't just the physical enemies that were coming out against David, but it was weird because Saul, I mean, Saul, like one minute he'd like David, and the next minute he hated him, trying to kill him, like Absalom, his own son, turned on him. There were spiritual forces at work as well because the big picture of this is, as you follow the lineage of King David, you're, you're talking about the bigger picture of redemption, of the Lord working his plan to bring salvation into the earth through his son, Jesus. And so the Lord wanted to stop David and, and then affect the bigger plan of David's influence on others and David's, his contribution to the next generation and, and on and on and on. And now that's true for you and I, cons- who, you know, where we're concerned as well because the plan of God doesn't end with you, it begins with you. And you, man, fighting that good fight, finishing your course, keeping the faith, it will not only affect you. If you really do that, it will affect many others. It'll affect the next generation. You can plant a seed in the life of somebody far from God and, and who knows, they could be the next Billy Graham, and you have a part in affecting multitudes for Christ for eternity. And so the Lord wants us to realize the importance of fighting the good fight of faith. And so here's David. We get this glimpse of him in the middle of a faith fight, and I want you to see that the fight of faith, again, involves your words. What did David say? He said, the Lord is my shepherd. And then he did what? He said, I shall not want. That's bold. It looks like he lost everything and he said, you know what, I'm not gonna lack anything. And then later on he said, Lord, because you're with me, I will fear no evil. That's bold. 
to say, I don't care what it, how scary it looks, I will not be afraid. That's faith. I love it. I do. I love it. It inspires me. And then later on, these are the I will statements. Now, he says a lot of in the 23rd Psalm of who the Lord is to me, but these have stood out to me lately where he said, I shall not lack. I will not be afraid. And then he says, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord or in the presence of the Lord forever. So he's saying, I'm not going to live in lack. I'm not going to live in fear, but I am going to live in the presence of God. Those are bold statements of faith. Now, look with me in 2 Corinthians 4.13. Oh, come on now. I want you to have some fight, man. Like I said, quit fighting with each other. (laughs) But let's fight (laughs) for each other. And let's choose to fight the good fight of faith where our lives are concerned, where our families are concerned, where our community is concerned, where our children are concerned, where our nation is concerned. Let's fight the good fight of faith. Notice 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 13. It says, and we having, come on, somebody say, I've got it. And we having the same spirit of faith as he had who wrote, now this is quoting King David, I have believed and therefore, I thought about it for a while and didn't say anything. Now, come on now. What does the fight of faith look like? What does real Bible faith look like? Well, here it says, I have the same spirit of faith as he who wrote, I have believed and therefore have I spoken. We too believe and therefore we what? Speak. This is how you fight the good fight of faith. Some might say, well, David could fight the fight of faith because he was David. He was special. You're a child of God. You're an heir of God and a new and a better covenant. You're a joint heir with Jesus Christ. Come on. You are powerful in God as a child of God. And you have the same spirit. Maybe you knew it. Maybe I'm reminding you of it. Or maybe you've never heard it before. But you have the same spirit of faith that David had when he faced Goliath. That David had in the 23rd Psalm. That David had in the 116th Psalm, which is being quoted here. You have the same spirit of faith. And how does that operate? We believe in God? Yes. But then we're not silent about it. We speak it, especially in the face of doubt, fear, discouragement, worry, care, anxiety. And when the enemy has launched a full-scale war on your soul to intimidate you and bully you and discourage you, this is a part of your training this morning. You You don't sit there and say, oh, ow, ooh, oh. Up, uppercut, oh, you know, right hook, you know, left hook. And then you're like, oh God, why aren't you helping me? And he's like, I gave you everything you need. And right now is not a time to cry out to me. Have you seen this in God's word? Where Moses is saying, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. And the Lord responds and said, hey Moses, why are you crying to me? Lift the rod and split the sea. That's bold. What's he saying? He's saying, I've already armed you and equipped you and given you power. There's a time to pray. and We should pray always. But there's a time to say some things and to stand your ground in faith where you tell the devil, you're not having my life. You're not having my family. You're not having my kids. Again, you're not having my future. I belong to Jesus. Jesus is Lord over me and mine and my house. I'm I'm getting a little feisty right now, but I'm about to pull out that sword of the spirit. Come on, somebody say, pick up your sword. I sense, man, the Lord gave me that for you, and I believe it with all my heart. He wants us, not in like a weird way, but in a a way of faith to say, you know what? I'm picking up my sword. I'm not going to be silent. I believe, and therefore, I will speak. And you know, as you do so, you cut into pieces the, the strategies and the lies and the deceptions of the enemy. And you, instead of losing ground, you gain ground. And you can come out of those fights even stronger. You know, if you can weather that storm and stay in faith and not quit and endure through the the test, the trial, the adversity, you'll come out of it stronger. And you'll have a testimony that'll help somebody else in their storm and their trial and their adversity.
where you can encourage them. And then you start to get like battle tested and you've got these scars in a, in a positive sense of saying, you know what, the enemy tried the same thing on me and this is what I did. I got God's word in my heart in that area. I got his word in my mouth in that area. I came into agreement with what he said about me concerning who I am in Christ. I found out his promises to me and I put it in my heart and I put it in my mouth and I let it change the way I see my future. That's faith in God. You can't see it. The fight of faith is you believing it and declaring it especially when you don't see it. If you could see it, that's not faith. That's easy. Anybody can do that. But it requires fight. It's a fight of faith where you contend with your emotions and what you can see and what you can feel. And you say, oh no, I believe in God. I believe in the word of God. I'm going to think, speak, and act in line with the truth of his word. Come on, somebody say, pick up your sword. Pick up your sword. Notice 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3. I'm going to give you some verses. I'm going to move quickly here. Also, I'm going to be preaching for 27 hours here, I think. So, because I'm trying to get through my introduction into my notes, actually. All right. Can you guys hang with me here? I'm going to go quick, but I want to give you these references. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3 says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. Talking about a fight. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, not natural. Not swords and guns and spears. Notice what he said, natural weapons. He said, but they are mighty. Come on, somebody say mighty. mighty. They are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down, notice this, imaginations. You know, when the Bible talks about the, the, um, the devil, talks about him this way. He's a liar. He's a thief. He's a murderer, right? Uh, he's a deceiver. He's a tempter. And so he uses, and we're not to be ignorant of his devices, the Bible says. That means mind games. He works in the arena of reason. Now, it's been said for years, and this is something we've, we've talked about before. If the devil can keep you in the arena of reason, he'll whip you every time. What does that mean? you just trying to fight on your own with what you think, how you feel, a natural fight. But if you can keep him in the arena of faith, you'll whip him every time. What does that mean? You're, you're fighting not a carnal fight, not a natural fight, but you're using the weapons of your warfare that are mighty through God in this faith fight, casting down imaginations. You could say, how do I do that? Very simply, this is again a faith fight where God's word, the written word of God is in your heart and the written word of God is in your mouth. And you're speaking out of a place of assurance. You're speaking out of a place of persuasion, being fully persuaded that what God said is the final authority. What he said is the word of the king. What he said is the word of truth. And you are taking sides with God and you're saying, I believe in your word. I believe it's true concerning me and my house and my family and my life and my future. So when those thoughts of depression and hopelessness and fear and anxiety and all the enemy's discouragement that he wants to pile up on top of you to suffocate you when it comes to you like it comes to all of us who are human beings, when it comes to you, you don't just sit there and let it stay there. You say, oh no, you don't. I'm a child of the most high God. It's written in his word that I have died together with Christ. I've been raised to new life in him. I'm a new creation in Christ. I'm blood washed, redeemed and sanctified, filled with the power of his Holy Spirit. Greater is he who is in me than he who's in the world. I'm not going backwards. I'm going to finish my course. I'm gonna run my race. I'm gonna do what God's called me to do and I'm going to love people as I do it but I'm not stopping here I'm not laying down come on you got some fight about you this morning church I'm looking at some of you you're like whoa what's going on this morning look sometimes you can't play around because there's too much at stake the Lord has plans for you high callings of God in Christ and he's encouraging us to fight. So he's given us these weapons of our warfare. One of the things we do is we cast down those imaginations. And notice, and every high thing or thought that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. And we bring it into captivity. Other translations say we take those thoughts hostage. I like that. And we what? We bring them into the obedience of Christ. Who is he? He is the living word of God. 
Jesus is the word. And so when you bring your thoughts in line with the word of God, you're acting on this. That's why it's so important to hide his word in our heart, right? To hear the word of God. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. We don't fight with tradition, everybody. Fight the good fight of tradition. No, 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 no. That, that won't carry you very far. We don't fight the fight of just our own intellect or natural knowledge on things. You got to fight the good fight of faith to overcome these spiritual battles. And the only way you can do that is by using the weapons that he gave you. Come on, somebody say, pick up your sword. Pick up your sword. Look with me in Ephesians chapter six. Notice what we see here. Now, I know this isn't rocket science, but I want us to have good biblical understanding that Ephesians chapter six comes after Ephesians chapter one <laughs> and chapter two. And so what do we see in Ephesians chapter one? Well, Paul prayed for the churches. He prayed for three things. And the third thing was this. He said, Lord, I'm praying for Christians that they would know, number three, the exceeding greatness of your power that is, us, that is toward us who believe. He said, according to the working of your mighty power that you wrought in Christ when you raised him from the dead and you set him in the heavenly places far above all principality, power, might, dominion, every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. So what's he saying? He's saying, I'm praying for the church, not that they would get more power. How many of you know sometimes it feels that way and you feel like saying, God, give me some more power. But Paul didn't pray that. He said, Lord, I'm praying that their eyes of their understanding, that they'd, they'd see the power that is in them and towards them and for them who believe. Come on, say, I'm a believer. He said, Lord, I pray they'd see this power. What kind of power? He said, the power that raised Jesus from the dead and set him in a place of high authority above all the forces of darkness and evil that exist in this world. And in chapter two, it talks about how we were, before we were in Christ, we were under the power of darkness. We were under the control of the enemy. But then it says, but God who is rich in mercy because of the great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, quickened us, made us alive together with Christ, and by grace we were saved, and he raised us up together and made us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Come on, you've been seated in a place of royal authority in Christ Jesus. You have authority in Christ over all the forces of darkness, over the devil himself. Amen. Amen. And so did you know the devil's afraid of you? And all he has, smoke and mirrors, come on, deception, lies. He wants to turn the God-given power <laughs> that you have against yourself. Jesus, through death, destroyed him who had the power of death, that is the devil. And so Jesus took away his authority and power, and he gave you and I the church, he raised us up in Christ, gave us authority in him over the forces of darkness. But if you believe the lies of the enemy and you say his lies and you say back and you come into agreement with what he's saying about you, you will imprison yourself and you'll turn the power that God's given to you against yourself. And I sense in my heart, that's why I'm being so bold about it. I know it's a little different this morning, but in a good way. The Lord's helping us this morning because you and I have to make the decision. We have to be determined to say, I will not be silent. Amen. And certainly, I will not side in and agree with what the devil's saying. But I'm not just going to not say what the devil's saying and stay in a place of silence. Instead, I'm going to lift my voice in faith. Years ago, I heard a minister say it this way. He said, many Christians even though they're sincere and they love the Lord, they're weak in life because they've never dared to make a bold declaration of who they are in Christ Jesus. And I'll tell you the truth, that is the thing that absolutely radically transformed my life is when I got God's word in my heart and in my mouth and I started to say about myself what God said about me in his word and I'll be honest, it felt awkward at first because I'm like, I know me righteousness of God in Christ? <clears throat> I don't think so. But that part in Christ is the key. It's not who I am in me. That's a sad picture. Who I am in him? That's gracious. That's 
powerful. That's, that's too good to be true news. The gospel alone reveals who you are now in Christ. And so too many times Christians have been so familiar with who they are in Adam, they've lost sight of who they are in Christ. And then the enemy wants to come and play on those feelings and those emotions and those lies that he brings to your mind and say, yeah, that's who you are. You're a sinner. You're a failure. Who you were is who you'll always be. There's no hope for you. And then here comes the lies, the discouragement. Has God really said, if you be? And then he goes down this trail of thoughts. Next thing you know, you're like, come on, somebody say, pick up your sword. sword. Ephesians chapter six. I better pick up this message right now or else... The kids are going to lead a revolt over here. All right. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Perfect closing. I'm telling you what. Notice verse 10. Finally, (laughs) finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Come on. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are what? Mighty through God. And put on the whole or the complete, the entire armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Remember, Ephesians 1 and chapter 2 says you're seated in Christ above all all of that in a place of dominion. You've been drawn out from under the control and the dominion of darkness into the kingdom of the son of his love. In him, you have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. I'm quoting Colossians chapter one. So that's who you are in him. Verse 13, wherefore, because of this, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day or the day of attack, the day of crisis. And having done all to stand, Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, his word is truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness, your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Verse 16, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you may be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Verse 17, and take the helmet of salvation and what? The sword of the spirit. Come on, somebody say, pick up your sword. Take the sword of the Spirit, which is what? Which is the Word of God. Now we see this in the book of Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. It says that the Word of God is quick, alive, sharper than any two-edged sword. And in that same chapter, it says in, in verse, let me read it to you here. I'm going to squeeze in an extra verse for you. Hebrews uh, chapter 4, verse 14, in that same chapter, two verses later says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest who's passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession or profession of what? Of faith. So he's saying the word of God, this is in the context of Israel taking the promised land. And it talks about those who didn't enter in because of their unbelief. But then it says, but the word of God is alive and full of power, sharper than any two-edged sword. That means, look, that's what you need to win the war, to win the good fight is what? Your offensive weapon. Everything else we read where the armor of God's concerned is defensive, standing your ground. You take that sword, man, you go on the offense. How do I do that? By holding fast my profession. In the Greek, it's homologeo. <laughs> which you probably don't use that very often. I don't know, maybe you do. But what? It means to say the same thing. The same thing as who? The same thing as God. When I hold fast my profession of faith, it means I say what he said about me, about my life, about himself, about my future, about my family, about our church, about our community, about our nation. And so when the devil comes, And he will through reasoning and thoughts. And sometimes he can use people. Have you found that to be true? But we don't wrestle with flesh and blood. Amen. We love people, but we know how to fight the good fight of faith. And we lift our voice and we say, I'm about to pick up my sword right now. And that means I'm not going to be silent. I would encourage you, especially in your prayer time and in your devotional time, driving down the road, whatever. And in life as it is necessary to pick up your sword. What does that look like? It's you saying, Father God, it is written in your word 
And I agree with you. When your soul's going crazy, you feel that discouragement coming, you get your sword out, you say, oh, no, you don't. I'm going to run my race. I'm going to finish my course. I am a child of God. I am redeemed by the blood of Jesus. And my Bible says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. And it says in Revelation, we overcome the accuser by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. So Jesus, in my 17th closing this morning, Jesus, in Matthew chapter four, when he was being tempted of the devil, The devil came out against him right after God spoke audibly and said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Here comes the enemy, the liar, the deceiver, the tempter, trying to thwart the plan and purpose of God. Look, if he could take Jesus down, we have no hope for eternity. We're lost. And so here's Jesus in this crucial moment for him, for the disciples, for you and I, for the entire world as our savior and redeemer. And the enemy of his soul comes against him. And right after God said, you are my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. The enemy came and said, if you're the son, planted that seed of doubt and then began to question and reason. You know what Jesus did? He got out his sword. He got out the sword. You can say, I wish I had that sword. You do have that sword. He got out the sword and he said, it is written. Jesus busted the devil with the written word of God. Now your feelings have nothing to do with that. Your emotions have nothing to do with that. Worship had a cold flash because it was too cold in here. Afterwards had a hot flash. It's like too hot in here, right? You don't, need any, you don't need any kind of hot flash, cold flash, goosebump. You don't need anything to say in the face of those lies and fears and doubts and discouragement. It is written. Enemy came back again. Jesus said, it is written. He came back again. Jesus said, it is written. And then the Bible says the devil left him. What did Jesus do? Jesus got out his sword. He fought the good fight of faith. And it says in James 4, 7, to you and I as believers, when you resist the devil, he will flee from you. Come on, Peter said, resist him steadfast in faith. Hallelujah. Did you guys get anything out of this long message this morning? Will you stand up with me this morning?